Okay, it is 930. So for this one who actually just got in, please put your name, telephone number, license number, and your email address. And the handout is actually located at www.max1partners.com forward slash CE. I just typed that information in the chat box as well. So if you don't have a handout, please uh, go to Max1 Partners um, forward slash CE. And just want you to know, this, this class is uh, is three hours. And hey, Charles, thank you for coming in this morning. Um, so we will begin um, now. And um, once again, this is trying to do this. Both is a little ch uh, challenging, so I apologize. All right. This class this morning is sponsored by Luther Larkin Hunter, uh, and they're not with us at this time. So, uh, well, actually, they're running a little bit late, so they may be popping in early. Uh, just want to thank them very much for hosting the class with us and making this opportunity for all of y'all to get your free CE credit. Uh, Luther Larkin's great partners with us has been for a while, and um, Deb and Beth Hudson at Petrie, and also at uh, Noonan. He is very good about you know answering any questions you may have. Good morning, come on in, grab one of those uh, pamphlet on your way in. Um, so anyways, they're awesome, awesome folks. If you have any question, you can always ask them to um, uh, find a title or, or what have you. So there you go, you got it? I do. Okay, awesome. So anyways, <clears throat> let's start our class. So if you're in here and you're in Zoom, just so you know, you have to stay uh, online for three hours in order to get your three hour CE. Uh, we do monitor by do the chat box. That's why I asked you guys earlier. And for those of you who are participating here in line, uh, on live, of course I can see you, thank you. Um, but I can, um, if you wouldn't mind, that's why we have you um, put your name and information in the chat box when you first log in. We'll ask you to do that during mid break as well, and as well as at the end of class, along with the poll that uh, goes along with it. So, anyways, um, there we go. All right. So, let me step out five seconds because I grab something real quick. That's weird. Okay, so I do apologize. I thought I had it with me, but I don't have it here. Okay, all right, that's weird. All right, let's move forward. Um, you do have to stay in here for three hours online. So just FYI, yeah, and I'll be probably moving back and forth due to the fact I had to manipulate the screen. It's harder to do it in person and live simultaneously. So y'all bear with me, huh? No, I'll, I'll maneuver. It's thank you, because you need to see this. <laughs> so there we go. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so that just a little notice for you guys to let you know that you have to be here for the duration of three hours. And also code of ethics, if you're a realtor, you have to take it every three years. Okay, once every three years, even though our license renew every four years, you have to take it every three years. So there's probably one year you're going to take it twice. So we just want to make sure you guys are refreshed on that. And for those of you who are not realtor, this will count as a CE credit. So you don't need anything else but a, other than just a CE credit. And as a realtor, uh, and we will send you a certificate um, after the Zoom class um, to, so you can take that certificate to your board member and show them that you actually uh, satisfy your uh, code of ethics class, okay? So anyways, all right, that was just a little notice and we'll move forward to, there it is, oh, sorry. 
Let me maximize this. I think that's all I can maximize on that one there. There we go. And let's see. I know there's a functionality I can do to where I can see the whole entire screen. I think it's F10. Nope. F11. There you go. See, I knew there was one. Okay. So anyways, this is actually, this handout is actually online for you guys to review as well, but you can follow me along through here as well. Uh, for those of you who are on Zoom, because it's on your screen right now. Okay. So it's basically a table of contents of what it consists of. You can actually download this on www.maxonepartners.com forward slash CE. The materials are online. So the objective is uh, to, upon completion, I promise a professional course participant will be able to identify key aspiration concept found in preamble to the National Association of Realtor Code of Ethics. Describe general business ethics and compare and contrast the realtor's code of ethics with business generally uh, ethics and generally describe the concepts established in Article 1, 2, 12, and 17 of code of ethics. I'm going to do this so y'all probably can see a little better online. There we go. Um, identify possible violation of the code of ethics specifically related to the article cited above after participating in interactive learning method, case studies, you will go over that as well. Quizzes, role play, demonstration, and group discussion about fact scenarios. And describe the professional standard process for enforcing code of ethics, include duty to arbitrate. So that is important, y'all, because a lot of people think they don't have to, but just the fact that you are a realtor, you have to abide by these code, okay? Identify critical elements of due process as they relate to code enforcement and then other factors concerned by hearing panel in procuring cost disputes. So that's an important one on procuring costs, okay? And the way we write the contract, why it matters the way we write it, because sometimes Asian put, you know, none or zero and stuff like that. So when you do stuff like that, guess what? You're not eligible for commission if um, you don't, you know, if you don't um, hold your client to it. All right. So we actually have a handout that is a article along with the question here. This is the icebreaker exercise. And if you have the pamphlet, it's actually on page two uh, in the bottom where it says, um, I make only truthful objective statements. There is a handout that's called Code of Ethics Standards of Practice. I know you can't see it here, but I'll pop it up in mine. So basically each one of these statements goes, there are 17 articles, okay? So each one statement is correlate to the article. Normally when I have people here, a lot of people here, well, I break you guys into a group and y'all get to figure out which one it is. But as we have majority folks are online, so we're gonna do this uh, cooperatively. And let me pull that out. So, hang on, nope. I have to find the right one, so I think that's it. So you should be able to see this is one of your part of your handout um, online. So these one, every one of these like article one talks about when represent buy and seller, landlord, tenant, other client as the agent, realtor, pledge himself to protect, promote the interest of the client. So uh, what you don't know is I'm switching back and forth. So this is, like I said, a little fun. Uh, so the first question is make only truthful and objective statements. There you go. I'm going to give you all a couple seconds to figure out which article that is. And for those of you that is not here, like I said, um, online, it's a little tough because you, you got to figure this out by yourself.
Okay, I was trying to find the paperwork I had earlier, so excuse me for five seconds. Hey, good morning. Come on in. Sorry. It's all right.
All right, I think this works. Okay, great. All right, just have to find this plug in. So, when did I leave all that? We'll put you guys online really quick. Because I want to do question one, two, and three already, which is um, make all these people an objective statement, avoid um, unauthorized practice of law, participate in professional standard enforcement. I am not going to learn. Do better. Wake up to the mat. Do better. Okay. Let me have a conference real quick. Okay, is this better? Can y'all hear me? I think I plug it back in. It should be good. Awesome. Thank you. Yay. Awesome. Thank you, y'all. Uh, thank you for letting me know. So we answer the icebreaker on page two of your handout. If you don't have it, once again, it's on max1.com forward slash CE. Uh, we're on page two. We went over the first question, which is make only truthful and objective statement. That correlates to um, article number 15. And number two was avoid the unauthorized practice of law. And that correlates to article number 13. And number three, participate in professional standard enforcement. That's article number 14. So it's 15, 13, 14 for the first three questions. And y'all should have the handout for the standard practice. This is updated this year as well. All right. All right, number four, keep client fund in separate escrow account. So y'all know what co-mingling is, right? Is when you all uh, mingle your personal funds with someone else's. Don't ever do that, okay? Uh, that is actually correlate to article number eight. So article number eight states, hang on one second. Realtors shall keep in special account in appropriate financial institutions separate from their own funds, money coming out into possession, and trust for other persons such as an escrow, trust fund, client money, other like items. So obviously the realtor, most of the agents out there do not have an escrow fund. Your broker has the escrow fund, okay? So let me ask you something really quick. If you have a client that you know is flying down from New York, because right now uh, there's a lot of New Yorker moving to Georgia. Uh, so let's say they're flying down looking for a house and you know they're in a hurry. It's Sunday night. They got to fly back out. And the last house you show, they decide this is the one they want. They want to go ahead and make an offer on it. Rather than wire to earn some money, they say, here, here's a thousand dollar cash. So how should you turn in your fundings to your broker? Should you convert that into a money order or should you give your broker cash? Okay, Charles say cash, that is correct. So as much broker doesn't like to take on cash, um, you have to give the item in the original form it was in. Any, if you try to convert it with a money order, uh, what have you, then you essentially had commingle. So, you know, cash is one of those things that I don't like to play with because if you lose one of the $100 bill, that's a hundred dollars. 
So normally I ask the client, you know, say, hey, there's a QT nearby, let's go get a Western Union a money, um, a money order, or let's stop by Kroger, go, you know, whatever it is, let's go ahead and get a, something in paper. So that way for two things, one, your lender has to know where that money's coming from, because with any earnest money, the lender has to validate and trace that earnest money from its point of origin. Okay, so if they can't, if it's mattress money, guess what? It doesn't count toward the buyer's um, purchase. So normally what we see as a broker at that point is that we just make an amendment, say all party agree there's no earnest money deposit right at closing, where the earnest money is refunded back to the buyer from the broker. And the buyer just basically have bring another additional, whatever the amount the earnest money is. So. You know, mattress money, you know, not so great when you get a loan cash. Absolutely. You have no lenders involved in that one there. Okay. So anyway, do not commingle. Um, and you guys should not, most of you guys should not have an escrow account unless it's approved by your broker who holds your license. And we don't approve any escrow funds simply because it's hard to track. Um, just so you know. Number four is article number eight, okay? And number five, the question is, receive compensation from one party only with informed consent. So actually it's right there by article eight, so number, article number seven. In tra transaction, realtors shall not accept compensation from more than one party, even if permitted by law without disclosure to all parties and, and the informed consent of realtor client or clients, okay? This is why when we refer a client out of state, we have to, first of all, get an acknowledgement from the client that they're being referred out, okay? And then we do the broker to broker uh, referral agreement, okay? It is by license law, your client has to be aware that they're being referred out. Now, if you have an exclusive listing agreement, Okay, part of that GAR form, it tell in, in, in the legal mumble jumble in between where you fill the blanks, there's a section that says that we have the right to refer them. So if you have either a listing, exclusive listing agreement or exclusive buyer brokerage agreement, that is covered. Okay, so if a buyer is moving out of town uh, or buyer is coming in town but has a house in North Carolina to sell, you can actually refer they're listening to um, someone, okay? Just make sure you let the client know that you're doing that, all right? Okay, any question? If you have any question, please ask in Q&A. Okay, someone asked me what was the question for, um, okay, I don't think about one, two, three. Um, somebody asked what was article one, two, three. We haven't got there yet. We did answer a question about one, two, three. The first one's Article 15, the second one's Article 13, third one's Article 14, the fourth one's Article 8. Okay. Um, number five, receive compensation from one party with, okay, well, we'll talk about that. Uh, re, number five is Article 7. Number six, ex, respect exclusive relationship. How many times have y'all heard? Another agent try to trespass on your clients. I'm sure y'all, if y'all been in this industry long enough, you're gonna have one or two, okay? Uh, and sometimes it's not intentional because it can be where the buyer didn't tell you they signed an exclusive buyer brokerage agreement with another agent and the agent did not service them. So therefore they came to you, um, but they didn't tell you whether or not they say, I have no realtor. You know, in their own opinion, just remember, they don't practice real estate. So in their own opinion, they feel like they have no realtor that's working for them. So therefore, in their honest answer, I have no, and you know, buyers, when they start a certain process, they sign a lot of paper and they don't realize what they're signing half the time. And just like purchase and sale, they relied on us and our expertise to tell them what to do. And they don't understand what contingency means. They don't know what the diligence means unless you sit down with them and explain that in full, okay? So for a lot of buyers, sometimes they'll say, 
I don't remember signing anything. And that's the honest truth, they don't remember. So with exclusive relationship, that is actually covered by article number 16. So I'm gonna scroll down here. Sorry, had to prop over here. So article number 16. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, these don't always scroll right. Realtors shall not engage in any practice or take any action inconsistent with exclusive representation or exclusive brokerage relationship agreement that other realtor have with clients, okay? So please don't do that, all right? Um, you need to pay attention to the relationship and this is why we help our client negotiate on their behalf. And that now there are some brokerages that does what we call flat fee listing, okay? And what that means that all they're doing is put the listing online and it's up to the seller to negotiate. Now, typically that is disclosed on your MLS. If it's, that's the case, then you're able to contact the seller uh, if given permission, okay? But other than that, nine out of 10, most of our listing are exclusive and to where we actually negotiate with for our seller okay so buyer's agent do not bypass the listing the uh seller's agent because you're gonna get yourself in a whole lot of hot water okay so and you do respect the exclusive activities number seven cooperate with other broker and that's actually found in article number three So realtors shall cooperate with other broker except when cooperation is not in the client's best interest. Meaning I'm a listing agent and the buyer's agent want all these repair. My seller is not in my client's best interest because some of those are cosmetic for a structural or a safety issue, okay? Uh, the obligation to cooperate does not include the obligation to share commissions, fees or other compensate uh, or otherwise compensate another broker. Just so you all know in here, what that means is that as a listing agent, and I know this sounds cruel, but in Georgia, we're so used to co-oping our commission with our counterpart because we want our counterpart to come in and make an offer and what have you. Now, at Color Ethics, in just so you know, in commercial arena, nine out of 10, all right, you have to ask that question up front. What is a co-op commission? Because in commercial arena, they don't have to share that. And commercial is truly a wild, wild west because with residential, we have a set of guidelines that we're used to. This is the norm, this is the standard. And commercial, anything goes. So before you get really excited about commercial, make sure you talk to your broker because your broker should be the one guide you. And plus there's so much liability in commercial that you may be prohibited doing a transaction by yourself, okay? Your broker may mentor you or take the file over if it's a, a commercial of where the, the industry is very specific, okay? Because with certain industry, there's common ground that you cover but with certain ones that you may not know the guidelines, okay? So on commercial, please don't write commercial. Uh, in nine out 10 on commercial too, the listing agent typically have their own forms, okay? Most of these corporate company has their own attorney that writes entire commercial contract. So to decipher those contracts, typically they're about, anywhere from I think as short as maybe 16 pages and as long as 75. So yeah. So on commercials a different different animal. So make sure you just consult with your broker on that. So People reference really like their realtors. Uh-huh. So they take the mission splits you've offered and also collect the buyers. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I have one agent, she has a, what we call a VIP agreement, okay? Part of VIP, this is her culture. This is how she treat her clients. She goes beyond your standard, uh, let's write contract, show houses, blah, blah, blah. She actually pull all the comps before writing an offer. She does a couple other things that kind of well educate her client, you know, uh, whatever her VIP program is, is in conformity of what she does. And so for that, instead of charging a, you know, normally a 3% normal, okay, uh, she actually let the buyer know her fee is three and a half percent. And if the seller does not pay up to three and a half, the buyer would need to make up differences. And that is upfront, is, is added as an addendum to a regular buyer brokerage agreement. So when you add it as addendum, it's more glaring okay, than your standard contract. So she go over all that and go over what she covers and what have you. I mean, it's a, you know, we all have different models of business. So you have to be very influential to, to talk to your buyer, to convince them, say, hey, this is my fee. If the seller pays only 2%, you may have to come with one half percent because it's a service I'm doing for you. Uh, I'm doing more than your average. This is what I do. I check in with you every week. I do this, whatever it is your model is, you know, it's working for her. So, and she has lots of referrals. That's because that's just her business model. Okay. And, you know, when you have a, a solid business model and, and technique, I can tell you, you'll have more referral down the road and referral is what's going to make the difference. Okay. To me, referral is a warm lead. You're not cold calling. You're not trying to prove yourself and what have you. So it's a good thing. All right, number um, eight. Question is, disclose present or contemplate interest in property. That actually correlates to with article number five. Oh, I think I've gone too quick. Realtors shall not undertake pr to provide professional service concerning property or its value where they have pre present or contemplate interest unless such interest is specifically disclosed to all affected party. Okay, so for sale by uh, agent owners. So if you, uh, you shouldn't provide professional service concerning property unless you have interest in it, okay? So, um, and if so, you need to disclose that to all parties. Like license law require us to disclose when we're buying a property or selling a property, we have to disclose all party knowledge that either seller or buyer, depending on which side you're on, holds an active Georgia real estate license, okay? So, so on article number five, you have to fully disclose, 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 because <clears throat> we're treated as, um, if you think about it, we're professional in our field. So we have to the advantage of knowing what to do, whereas the general public do not know. So therefore they know they're dealing with a professional. So number eight, the answer is article number five, okay? Number nine, treat all party honestly. That actually go to the very first article, which is when representing a buyer, a seller, landlord, tenant, or other client as an agent, realtor pledge themselves to protect and promote the interests of their client. The obligation to the client is primary, but it does not relieve realtor of their obligation to treat all party honestly when serving a buyer, seller, landlord, tenant, or other party in a non-agency capacity, what that means, customer and said client. Uh, realtor remain obligated to treat all party honestly. So just so you know, Georgia law, um, if the property was a property where a homicide occurred, as a realtor, do you have to disclose it? Okay, the question is, as a realtor, if you knew the house had a homicide in it, do you have to disclose it? Huh? 
bingo, okay? Only if you're asked, okay? So if you're, because Georgia law is that we don't want to stigmatize a property, okay? You can't stigmatize because things happen all the time. Sometimes it can be, and I know this sounds horrible, a drive-by shooting and a bullet went to the wall and killed someone, okay? Um, that actually had happened recently uh, in Atlanta. And um, so you can't stigmatize a property just because someone decided to go to a nice neighborhood, just start going crazy, okay? So if you're asking, been asked a question, you do have to answer it honestly. But if you're not asked of the question, you don't have to get answer it, all right? We're talking about stigmatization. And there's a story behind this. I had an agent of mine call me after closing and say, man, you won't believe what happened. I said, what do you mean? She's, he's like, well, you know, I represent the buyer and the buyer asks directly to it because they're very, you know, they're into the feng shui and different things and whatever. Um, one question they ask the seller, has anybody died in this house? The seller answer was no. Okay. So come to find out after the buyer bought the house, moved in, went, of course, met by the neighbor. And the neighbor said, I can't believe you bought that house. <laughs> and the buyer's like, What do you mean? So the buyers uh, and the, the neighbor proceeded to tell them, Well, the husband died in there. So, of course, the buyer was mad and want to know what happened. Well, come to find out that the husband was cheating on his wife, died while he was with his girlfriend, and the girlfriend called the husband's best friend to move the body back to the house. So technically, the husband did not die at the house. His body was moved to the house. So answer the question, honestly, he didn't die there. I know, I know. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I hear a lot of story and uh, and that was one very unique one. <laughs> so, <laughs> the seller answered, honestly, he didn't die in that house. His body was moved while he was with his girlfriend and to the property. That's another reason why they were selling the house. It used to be around this part of the world well yes 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 <laughs> yeah well yeah and just so you know all of your contract has a and please point those out on your purchase and sale and listing agreement there is a section that said uh that talks about dea department of uh drug enforcement and it talks about if a house has been tagged as a meth house and also uh, GBI, Georgia Investigation Bureau, GIB or whatever, I can't remember the acronym now. Um, but anyways, uh, talks about crime rates and they also need uh, sex offenders. So, you know, let the client know is there if they want to look, but I can tell you right now, if you try to look up, especially the crime, you probably won't move anywhere, but in a 10 acre lot because it doesn't matter where you live. Unfortunately, there's going to be people just just practice safety, you know. And yes, some are more than the other. So you know, it's up to the individual who's purchasing a property to see what their tolerance are. Okay. So, anyways, so you have to answer question honestly. All right. Okay, number 11, arbitrary contractual dispute. Now, Article 17 is the answer for this. I'm gonna scroll all the way down. Article 17 actually constitutes where a lot of uh, issues that arise for arbitration and mediation. Uh, in the event of contractual dispute or specific non-contractual dispute as defined standard practice of 17-4 between realtor principal Associated with different firm arising out of their relationship as realtor, the realtor shall mediate the dispute. The board requires a member to mediate. 
If the dispute is not resolved through mediation or if mediation is not required, realtors shall submit the dispute to arbitration in accordance with the policy of the board rather than litigate the matters. So this actually came a couple case study on this too. In the event client realtor wish to mediate arbitrate contractual dispute arise of real estate transaction, realtor shall mediate or arbitrate those disputes in accordance with the policy of the board providing client agree to be bound by any result agreement or afterwards. So basically as a realtor, you are required, if your board offer mediation, you are required to mediate before you arbitrate, okay? Mediation is a voluntary process where arbitrate is not, is a, it's more a legal um, and appointed and it costs money. So we try to resolve everything internally first before we spend some money and argue about. So it, you got to make sure that your, whatever that money involved is significant enough for you to go arbitration after mediation. Okay. All right. Number 11, uh, equal professional service for all. That's actually on article number 10. Realtors shall not deny equal professional service to any uh, person of reason, of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, or mere status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Realtors shall not be party to any plan or agreement to discriminate against a person or person on the basis uh, basically, it talks about fair housing, okay? We cannot discriminate based on fair housing. You got to service all, okay? Now, if you're so busy, you can't take on another client, you can always refer them out, okay? But you can't deny them of any services, all right? Okay. Um, make your true position known when presenting offer. Number 12 is article number four. Oh, too far. Realtors should not acquire an interest or in buying presenting offer from themselves, any member of the media family, their firms, or member thereof, or any entities in which they have any ownership interest, any real property without making their true position known to the owner or owner's agent or broker. In selling property they own or which they have interest, realtors shall reveal their ownership and interest in writing to uh, the purchase of the purchase representative, okay? Um, on your GAR contract form on page one, number 10.C, I know this because I read them all the time and my agents know I'll gig them every time. Um, there's an, in the form, it says any material relationship, okay? If you don't have any, just put N A. Because when you skip over a line and not answer it, it's left to interpretation, okay? Now, material relationship, what they define that now anymore is not just the blood relationship. It's about frequency, okay? So if it's your best friend, you have material relationship, okay? If it's your, uh, your boss, you have a material relationship. So you don't have to disclose what type of relationship, all you gotta do is that the listing or the, the selling broker or agent has a relationship with the seller. You don't have to disclose what type, but you do have to disclose there's material relationship. Used to fiance, because it's not family bloodline that was not disclosed, now you have to disclose that you have material relationship. Yes, ma'am. So if it's a client that you do business with, mm -hmm. would you yeah. Yeah, I would disclose that, you know, I mean, there's no harm disclosing, you know, uh, that you have, I mean, what's, because actually to me is an advantage because if it's an investor I've been working with a lot, when I talk to the other agent, you know, I have a true relationship with him and based on my transaction with him, he always nine out of 10, 90% of the file that we submit, he closes. You know, so if you have a material relationship with an investor, just say buyer's uh, agent has a material relationship with a buyer. You don't have, or you can say previous real, uh, real estate relationship with a buyer. You don't have to disclose what type. You just have to disclose there's a material relationship. Okay. So. Yes, sir. If, um, if at the time you enter into the contract, there is no material relationship but uh, let's say that at, that's part of the closing, uh, 
his property is to be uh, closed in the name of an entity uh, that the buyer has a mature relationship. Do you have to do that? Doesn't matter because honestly, it talks about your. Okay, the question is. What happened if you get under contract at the time, um, under contract, the buyer went from the buyer to an entity. All right, this is between the buyer and the entity. The relationship's about the agent and the client or the customer, okay? So it's not about the client itself. You probably will have to do an amendment to agreement stating all party agree, John Doe is now removed from the purchase, whereas, ABC Corporation is now the purchaser. So that's an amendment about who we're transferring buyers, not necessarily a relationship the agent has with the client or the customer. That makes sense? Yeah, and frequently you mentioned commercial. It is already in the agreement that it's assignable. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And also, just so you know, a lot of contracts uh, has assignment. So be careful um, when you do, especially commercial property. This is what I mean by commercial. It's really a wild, wild west. Um, and even new construction has an assignment agreement because the builder can, let's say they're in a period where they're being looked at by another bigger conglomerate that won't buy them. They can check off, we can assign this file to someone else. And that's acceptable. Okay, the term condition doesn't change. It just got assigned it to a different entity or person. Okay, good question. All right, um, number 13, be competent in your field of practice. That actually correlates to article number 11. Okay, article 11 said the service which a realtor provide to their client and customer shall conform to the standard practice and confidence which are reasonably expected in specific real estate discipline in which they engage specifically residential real estate, a brokerage, real, okay, so real property management, commercial, industrial real estate brokerage, land brokerage, real estate appraisal, real estate counseling, real estate syndication, real estate auction, international real estate. So what they're saying is that you guys should always conform to the standard, whatever specific field that you are practicing in. So if you're in residential service and you never done commercial, I can tell you it's totally different. Same thing as property management. At maximum one, we don't do property management, okay? Because the liability for property management, unless you're in it day in, day out, is it very time sensitive? There's tenant landlord law that you need to know. And because we don't touch that subject, we do not do property management because the liability and the, the insurance on that is huge if you ever get caught mismanaging. Because tenant, there are some tenant that knows that is good steward and good studier of the internet and they'll go online and look up what is tenants right. And they'll go to a certain article which would justify their case based on the point of view and come after the landlord, you know? And uh, so uh, some of you don't, I don't know if you know this section eight, uh, if you don't fix a certain thing, you don't get paid for those tenants. Not only that, uh, section eight has come back and reinspect if it's bad enough issue. Okay, so anyways, whatever an auctioneer, real estate auction is a different ballpark. If y'all ever gone to an auction site, you'll see they'll say buyer pays a premium of 5% of sale price. Okay, so be informed in whatever you're engaged in and just uh, understand what the standard is. If you're unsure, always ask your broker, okay? I do lots and lane. Mm -hmm. I need to talk to you. <laughs> I was really surprised how many agents would call on a listing and tell me they don't know what they're doing and start wanting to know if maybe their client can just call me. Mm -hmm. So what's your name? Jim White. Okay, so Jim here is does a lot of land and 
Melody Hutchins. Hutchinson. Does a lot of land deals. If y'all need land deal, let me know. I'll give you their number. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, like Jim mentioned earlier, he does a lot of land deal. A lot of agents don't understand it. So when they look at the land contract purchase, they're kind of stumped because they don't know how to fill it out. Um, so if you don't know, consult your broker. Um, most of my agent knows if it's something that I haven't done in the past, I ask them go ahead, pre-fill it out and I'll review them and I'll start go through the bullet points with them and ask them questions. So um, that's the best way of doing it, okay? Um, where are we? Okay, number 14, get transactional detail in writing. That's article number nine. And we all know for the protection of parties shall assure whether possible that all agreeing related to real estate transaction including but not limited to, to listing and representation agreement, purchase contract, lease are in writing in clear and understandable language express the specific term, condition, obligation, and commitment of the party. A copy of each agreement shall be furnished to each party in such agreement upon signing or initialing. This is very important, y'all. And the reason being is that In our world, even though back in the old days, verbal was good, anymore now, unless it is in writing, I can't honor it. And unfortunately, that's where we are at because you, I deal with earnest money dispute because I am the compliance broker for our firm and me and a couple others, uh, that helps me. And um, so I have to go and interpret each contract and the term and condition. So when y'all put TBD to be determined, that is not meeting of the mind, okay? Uh, when you put attorney to hold the earnest money, well, you put seller's choice. What is seller's choice? Because that F510 and 511 is important, y'all, because if you don't put someone in there, then, the new FI 11 by 10, which I like, makes it the selling, the, I'm sorry, the buyer's agent responsibility if the FI 11 is not signed up by the closing attorney, the earnest money automatically default to the buyer's brokerage as a holder. So that is the new midterm changes on the FI uh, 10. So if you can't get the closing attorney to sign off on the F511, y'all better switch gear quick because if you don't notify your broker that the attorney won't sign off, then your broker and yourself is in default. And you can kill the entire contract because you don't have earnest money in writing in proper timeline format. Because just remember your whole entire contract in there it only addresses the buyers and sellers and listing uh, the selling agent and the buyer uh, agent. There's nowhere in there that ties the closing attorney to that contract and act as a holder unless they sign the F511. Okay, so make sure you get your um, attorney sign it. Now, I have known cases, matter of fact, we have one recently came up where the closing attorney refused to sign because they won't sign until they get the earnest money, okay? Well, the problem is F510 talks about three days for the attorney to sign, but the earnest money is not due until five days. So you see what a time gap is? So we actually had, I, my agent notified me in time, said, hey, the closing attorney refused to sign. I say, that's fine. Now I have to send a notice to all party and let everybody know we're now the holder. And y'all need to do an amendment because the, if the closing attorney refuses to sign, then we're gonna have a problem down the road if there's a dispute. Now, everything goes smoothly, there's not a problem, but we all know, you know there's that percent that it doesn't go. And that's when the problem comes. And this is probably why your broker is so diehard, get you guys to sign a FI-11 because without a signature on it, whoever is a buyer's broker has to hold earnest money. Now, there are some brokerages that do not have escrow fund. 
So that becomes an issue. Okay. All right, because without the earnest money, the entire contract is basically the buyer has defaulted. So after negotiating so long with the client and also showing the houses, the last thing you want to do is to fail the contract, terminate the contract, terminate by seller because you, we don't have identified person for owner's money. Okay, the earnest money was not done properly. All right, so always get your stuff in writing in details because I can tell you, I know agents will call me and say, but this is what she told me or but this is what he told me. I was like, is it in writing? It doesn't matter what they tell you. It has to be in writing, okay? Uh, disclose pertinent facts. Number 15 is goes with article number two. Realtor shall avoid exaggeration, misrepresentation, or concealment of pertinent fact relating to the property or transaction. Realtor shall not, however, be obligated to discover latent defects. We're not, inspector, y'all, in a property to advise on the matter outside the scope of their real estate license or to disclose fact which are confidential under scope of agency and non-agency relationship as defined by state law. So, when they say confidential, um, it can be a court cases, okay? And the reason why you're delaying the closing is because we have certain things to settle. If it's confidential, the client doesn't want you to disclose it, you can't disclose it, okay? All you can do is extend, you know, granted, the other party's gonna be pretty mad, all right? Especially in today's market. So you can't. And our job is not to, you know, now, if you went to a listing appointment and you went down the basement, in the corner basement, there's a very visible hole in there. And you ask the seller, say, hey, what is that down there? So the seller took a piece of furniture and said, nothing, don't worry about it. Okay, cover up the hole. Okay, if you know of latent defect, you have to disclose it. Now, that's a tough conversation that you're gonna have with your seller. Okay, if they don't agree, say thank you very much, but I'm not the agent for you because she can't. Okay, so, um, and the seller won't disclose it, you have to disclose it. Now, they might be mad at you for disclosing it. I will put in proper remark there's a home basement, you know, if you are going to go and take that listing. Okay, but nine out of 10, if a client is that adamant about non disclosing, then I would probably walk away from that listing. Okay. Uh, Things can really sneak up on you too. I was representing a buyer of a building lot, mm -hmm. and I didn't know he was why I was divorcing. Him. And even though he had a corporation, it's part of tied into it. Close that deal until his divorce is settled. Signed off on that settlement. Yeah. If the seller hadn't agreed, you know, we would have been out of luck. Right. Really so the question, the, uh, the response was, uh, Jim had a buyer who was in the middle of divorce, even though the property was purchased through a corporation until it was signed off by the judge that it's okay to buy this property, they can move forward. So anyways, there we go. <laughs> All right, number 16, disclose financial benefit from recommending product or services. That core relates with article number six. Realtors shall not accept any commission rebates or profit on expenditure made for their client without client knowledge and consent. When recommending real estate product or services, owner insurance, warranty program, mortgage financing, title insurance, et cetera, realtors shall disclose the client or customer of whom recommendations may uh, any financial benefit or fees other than real estate referral fee. The realtor or realtor's firm may receive as a direct result such recommendation. So this is why your brokerage has, everybody has it. If they don't, you might want to ask your broker. Affiliate business disclosure, okay? Um, so that little thing is basically a blanket statement saying we may or may not have affiliation with a lender, the title company, the home warranty, everything that you have that can, that involve purchasing real estate, uh, because we don't know who our client's gonna choose, nine out of 10. So the ABAD is to be in compliance with RESPA, uh, who regulates uh, us. 
okay, on the um, on the consumer protection because that is a full disclosure, okay. So ABAD affiliate business disclosure is most, I mean, most brokerage, even the investors, I've seen them put that in there as well on the paperwork. All right, last one, paying true picture in advertising. So since that's the last article, that'll be article number 12. So realtors shall honestly and truthfully in their real estate communication shall present a true picture of the advertising, marketing, and other representation. Realtors shall ensure that their status of real estate professional is rarely apparent in their advertising, marketing, and other representation that the recipient of all real estate communication are or have been notified in the communication are from the real estate professional. So you have to make sure you advertise true to your position as well as the property you're advertising, okay? So if there's any discrepancy, I know in MLSs, it says it has a disclaimer and their uh, all information may be uh, correct, but subject to error or whatever, because we're human. We, when we do inputting in the system, we may or may not, instead of one acre, we put an extra zero in there. That's a huge difference, <laughs> you know, one acre versus 10 acres. So, um, you know, and it's up to the buyer to discover any issues with the listing. If once you've been notified an issue with listing, please go ahead and correct them, okay? So, was this fun? You're like, nah. <laughs> All right, so moving forward, let me switch to another, and that's your articles. And just so you know, they also updated article this year, talks about different items as well. The changes, we'll go through that later if we have time. Uh, hang on. All right, so this is where we are. All right, the history of code ethics. Prior to 1990, there was no licensing of real estate practitioner. It is based on speculations and exploitation and disorder was the rule. Caveat emptor, buyer beware, governs the transaction. So Georgia is a caveat emptor. So that's why we have the contingencies in place. One of its due diligence, which I call get out of jail for free. You can terminate for no reason at all and get your earnest money back. Uh, the other two are financing and appraisal, okay? So National Association of Realtors formed in 1908. Code of Ethics was adopted in 1913 to establish professional standard of conduct because prior to that, basically we, have you ever been in a group where you have a really good salesperson? They'll tell you, oh yeah, these land they're getting ready to develop, it's got great lake lots. You know, I know it's only worth 5,000 today, but I can tell you in, in five years, it's gonna be worth 50 grand. You better get in while you can. You know, so back then it was very much uh, who's got the biggest advertisement. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so now, so that's why the uh, Code of Ethic was adopted in 1913 to establish Code of Conduct so we can abide by honesty, integrity, and deal with professionalism. Okay. Uh, the Code of Ethic was the first business ethical at ethic after those of medicine, engineering, law. So we're one of very few. But if y'all think about it, how much does it cost you guys, Dina, medicine, engineering, law, to get that degree? Do you know how much it costs to get a licensing in medicine, engineering, law? Try about six figure and plus, okay? So I know how much we all pay for our licensing. Just because we pay very minimum, please don't treat it as such because I can tell you, you can make just as much money as those professional designation. So just because it's cheap does not mean it has no value. It has a lot of value, okay? Um, we service to the public, uh, we commit to professionalism. The original code can do, includes duty to client and duties to other brokers, okay? Um, and code of ethic as basis for later adopted license law. This is how we, because not everybody that are in real estate business are realtors. If you're not realtor, you're not technically abide by code of ethics. So we still have some people practicing like the wild, wild west. So this is where 
the license law came in afterwards. Uh, code requirements since inception, the code was require arbitration of contractual dispute between among realtors, respect for other broker exclusive relationship with clients and cooperation between members, just like I co-op with you. You know, for me, especially in today's market, you know, if I'm a buyer's, buyer's agent, I want to be very nice to the listing agents and I'm going to address them respectfully and, and also talk to them and say, hey, listen, I know you're going to have multiple offers on this property. Tell me what my client can do, make it better transition for your seller. When you approach a listing agent like that versus a very aggressive, negative, or use profanity, I can tell you nine out of 10, that agent's going to write you off because of the way you conduct yourself. Okay. Um, so anyways, all right, the code of ethics, uh, the pathway to, oops, uh, business ethic, NAR code of ethics and pathway professionalism. So there's two, three section. One of them is business ethics. What, it, what are business ethics? It's based on industry code and standards and your company with every brokerage, there's company policy and procedures, how you conduct certain things. Uh, individual value and what do you value? Because you know your values got aligned with your company's policy and procedure, and also practice with your industry. So they all kind of tie in together. Uh, business ethics and legal standards, as well as business ethics and realtor code ethics, are part of the pathway. So realtor, we may engage in many specialty area, may be subject to various codes and canons of those fields, such as legal ethics, uniform. Standards of professional appraisal practice, national auctioneer, code of ethics, code of national association, realtor institute, society, and councils. Regarding their real estate specialty a field of practice, all realtors are bound by the code of ethics of the National Association of Realtors. Okay. All right. Aspiration concept preamble to the code, basically under all that is in the land upon its wise utilization, utilization widely allocate ownership, depend on survival and growth of a free institution of our civilization. Realtors shall recognize the interest of the nation as citizens require highest and best use of land and widest distribution of land ownership. They require creation of adequate housing, the building of functioning uh, cities and development of productive industries and farm and the preservation of healthy, helpful, healthful environment. So basically for the preamble to, uh, to the code is basically, you know, respect the land, the properties that we have and understand that anytime anybody purchase a property, it's their legacy, okay? And your legacy is what you'll leave behind with your children, you know, whether it's wealth growth or what have you. So treat it with respect, okay? Um, and that's pretty much, you guys have this uh, in your handout, so I'm going to let you read it versus me just going through, uh, read over this stuff, because we do have some case um, um, that we will follow. All right, so we practice by the golden rules as well. Hang on. Under all is the land, the golden rule. Uh, we're also widely allocate all, uh, ownership and widest distribution land ownership. Maintain, maintain and improve the standard of our calling, share our common responsibility for the integrity on our real estate professional. Because I know if you have to take a survey right now, some people rate us as a little slightly above used car salesperson. Okay. So when you approach a client professionally and ethically, they are gonna think differently about you, okay? So this is what we need to do and maintain our standard and professionalism. And don't be that one-time agent, okay? I can tell you there, there are agents I've met in my lifetime that are what I consider a one-time agent. They're there to make that one deal, doesn't care whether or not their client are the, got the best deals or the client have received the best benefit for that particular transaction, okay? For them, it's about, you know, getting my commission at the end. And that's not how we operate. All right. So, and this is why, you know, it's great when you go to network and function, we share our experience and expertise uh, with others. Um, 
We also, this is why we have professional standard board in um, uh, Georgia Association Realtor. We identify and limit practice that damage the public or might discrediting discrediting or bring dishonor to real estate professionals. So this is why the guard form changes every year. It's protect the brokers and the agents. Um, and because there are people that are so happy. Uh, I think it was probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was five years ago, the guard actually came out that if we don't close a deal, the most liability that will occur is $100. And it's in big, bold font. Now, if we do close, our most liability would be our commission if we made a huge mistake. Okay, so this is why the GAR form is changed every year. Um, I like it. I know you can use RE form, and I'm not discriminating one form or the other, but I just know because GAR form is governed by a professional standard board. They're going to change it according to the industry. What's the trend now? Whereas RE is a complementary um, form and it get it doesn't get updated every year. Okay. And it came out 2012. Some of those forms are still 2012 if you look at revision date on it. Okay. Um, urge exclusive representation client, refrain from taking unfair advantage of your competitor. Uh, let's see, do not make unsolicited to come about other practitioners. Okay, we don't do that. And if your opinion is sought about a competitor or you believe a comment is necessary, offer it objectively in a professional manner. Okay, don't put your personal opinion on it. Tell them what the facts. Okay, remember the term realtor stand for competency, fairness, high integrity, moral conduct, and business relations. Keep in mind that no inducement of profit or instruction from client can justify, can justify departure from the code duties, okay? Now the preamble may not be the basis for discipling a realtor on that, but they are evidence for violation. So the structure of code and how it's amended, um, there are three major section. Duty clients and customer, duties to the public, and duties to realtors. Uh, the code and Article 17 are broad statement of ethical principles. Only violation of the article can result in disciplinary action. So you have to violate the article itself for disciplinary action. The standard practice support, interpret, and amplify the article which they are stated. Realtor may not found in violation of standard practice only in its found it, uh, foundational article. Standard practice may be cited in support of allegation violation of articles such as violation of article one as interpreted by standard practice one through three. The official case interpretation of specific fact situation that explain article in our standard practices. And how code evolves. When needed, amend to the code that standard practice, the official interpretation of may at the NAR mid year. Have any of you been NAR mid year? conferences it's really actually a lot of fun um they they usually have the big players like seth wiseman sometimes will teach in one one and a half ce credit but it talks about legalities what's going on okay it's very informative and it's also very um it's kind of nice to get to know some of the folks that are big players in the industry uh, and plus you got all these villas out there that's giving you swag and stuff like that. It's kind of fun. So, um, so we need it. Um, okay, we'll talk about here. So if you have an opportunity to go, I would encourage you to go. Okay. The NAR Interpretation Procedure Subcommittee Frequency um, makes recommendation to Professional Standard Committee about enhancement to Professional Standard Procedure and to the Code Ethics. So all proposed change to the code and to the policy and procedure by which the code is enforced must be approved by board of directors. Amendments to Article 17 also must be approved by the delegate uh, body. So I served as state uh, director uh, a couple of years and uh, I'm actually serving it this year as well. We go to in the mid years, they'll talk about different things that's being brought by different regions and why it's being adopted. So you get kind of, it's really fun um, if you have an opportunity to serve on your local board, you know, just to know what they're talking about. And it's very professional in there too, so. Um, so the code and the law, the code must be reasonably and consistently constru uh, construed with the law. So even though we have codes, the law is gonna supersede our codes, 
Okay. Uh, the code imposed duties above the addition to duties imposed by law or regulation. Typically, our code is more stringent than most of your, uh, your laws in any uh, state. The code reinstates certain fundamental legal principles, uh, contract agency, and fair housing. All right, talk about business ethic, pathway professionalism, three major sections, respect for the public, respect for the property, and respect for your peer. When we say respect for the public, meaning, let's see. Here we go. Follow golden rule. Treat other people like you would like to be treated. That's the bottom line. Okay. Respond promptly, inquiry, and request for information. How many of you guys have tried call a listing agent and get absolutely zero response? Okay. Or call and text. And but understand we're we're in different market today. And 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 to their credit, I've been on both sides. So you know they're getting back to back to back to back showing. And so as a listing agent, if you put in private remark as information, as much information as you can, like sellers gonna wait until Monday if you're doing an open house on the weekend, um, sellers can wait until Monday, make a decision. Now, if you're gonna have an open house and you had an offer before the open house and you gonna cancel the open house, make sure that you contact all the agents that has done a showing time request and let them know there is no open house Be go ahead i'm sorry to interrupt you but here's the challenge to that you've got a significant number of buyers agents that are doing business from their cell phone mm -hmm. and they don't read the remarks and then they call you and because i'm like this when i do a listing every day i provide an update the correct most right offers, I do invariably Right. It's already on there. So buyer's agent, make sure you read the private remark because listing agents probably getting about 50 phone calls if it's a hot property a day. Probably more. And they can't service all 50 of us, it, you know, calling them. But normally a good listing agent will put in their private remarks on what the terms are. You know, some of them say, please do not call please go through showing time increments is our 15 minutes and please allow other to come simultaneously because there's time that we run late due to traffic is beyond our control, even though we have good intentions. So don't be upset, you know, um, and you know, a lot of folks now, if you have a client that is very COVID fearful, please make sure you put in prior remarks, do not come in without booties and gloves you know, or have your client provide a booting gloves and just put in your private remarks. So selling agent, if you want to have an opportunity to win the bid, read instruction, okay? And I can tell you, listing agent, um, we have one that was 64 offers on the property. Now tell me that it doesn't take you a little bit to go through 64 offers. It does. So don't get upset when they can respond back, okay? And normally if it's that many, I will put in a prior remark, total of 60 plus offers. If you did not receive a response from me, I apologize, but you were not the recipient that was awarded, okay? You can put down prior remarks and as buyer's agent, it is the crazy market we're in. I've never seen one as aggressive as this one and I've been real estate for a long time. <laughs> so, um, I've seen the ups and downs. I've seen the flip side of it, where I can buy a property during downtown market for 50 grand. You know, easy, easy peasy. And it's minimal repairs in certain areas. <laughs> so, uh, but just make sure you have respect for the public. Uh, try to do all you can as a listing agent. If you're more detailed in your private remarks, the better off everybody is. And selling um, buyer's agent, Read the private remarks, okay? Never criticize property in presence of the occupant, y'all. Okay, that's just common courtesy. Uh, leave your business card if not prohibited by local rule when enter property ensure that unexpected situations such as pets are handled appropriately. You'll see engine, if you have pets in the house, please disclose there's pets, okay? 
because there are some people have legitimately real fear against pets. Okay, so uh, I know these sounds like common rules, but these are our legitimate rules. Um, and also, just because you have an approval on showing time, if you see a car outside of in a garage, make sure you always ring a doorbell and knock before you enter. Uh, we had an incident, believe it or not, the agent, well, not just me, another agent of mine too, um, <laughs> she had a confirmed showing at 5 p.m. while they decided to move their time up to three o'clock. And they, because lot box was out there, they opened a lot box. My seller just got out showered. Okay, she's been working a yard all day, and so she figures she's got a couple hours before the next client come in. So she took a shower. So that was a big no no. Okay, I you know we can definitely record uh, report the agents, and you know don't play this innocent card like well I thought it said no no no. We all know what it thoughts, okay? So don't do that. So always ring a doorbell if you suspect there may be somebody at the house, okay, before you go in. All right, um, we have one that told the, the seller that the agent approved the showing time when it was not approved. Yeah, so anyway, show courtesy and be respectful to everyone. Be aware of me all and me all deadlines. Uh, don't get mad if you can't meet the deadline because she didn't find a house until after fact. You know, it is what it is. Uh, identify your realtor and professional status and contact with public. Don't tell people what you think. Tell them what you know. And that's the bottom line. Okay. And that's respect to the public. Respect for the property. Let's say it was raining over the weekend. Um, if you are, don't walk across the yard with soggy grass and get in somebody else's house. Okay, without removing your shoes. These are just respect for the property. Okay, and turn off the lights when you're done because the seller was kind enough to turn on the lights for you so you can see, but turn it off when you leave. Okay, uh, try to keep all the group together because sometimes you might have somebody wandering off and next thing you know, there may be a piece of item missing. And, you know, unfortunately, I always tell my client, lock up all your valuables bottom line don't leave it out don't even tip anybody okay um so leave the property as you oh also there is one time and i formed a really good relationship with kelly adam through this uh she had an reo property out in the country club so when i approached it the house was, was unlocked and the back door was wide open so i report that to her immediately and because of that, she was very, and we did a really good relationship because what happens if the next agent come behind you and said, the house is unlocked and back door is open, then she's gonna look at her super lock box and see who accessed it before she did. And then she's gonna give me a phone call. Say, why didn't you tell me? You know, so always if you see any vandal or looks like the ceiling of the roof has been stepped because we have some, we have folks in the past, a buyer, think their 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 kick is HVAC so they'll go up to the attic space and look at the HVAC while they're doing that they step onto the sheetrock and seal the beams so that has happened in the past so if that happened just be honest say my client made a mistake and we step on you know you shouldn't be up in the attic for one okay unless they're professional inspectors even then just wait um Anyways, just make sure you inform the agent what's going on. Uh, respect for your peers. Basically, try to respond to the other agent's requests uh, as much as we can. Now, it, in today's market, listing agents are really, really busy reviewing contracts. So read a proper remark, because I think it's going to tell you more um, than trying to waste everybody's time. Um, and just make sure if you're going to be late in your showing, Give the other person a courtesy call, especially if it's occupied home, because these sellers are getting out their house so you can see it, and it's not fair for them to be out of house at six o'clock when you don't even show up until six forty-five. You know, so just be courteous, okay? And also, any more now these days, uh, just FYI, as a side note, a lot of houses are equipped with ring and also ring security. So, buyer's agent. 
word to the caution, tell your client, do not say anything derogatory. Do not mention how much you love it. Don't place furniture on, you know, while you're there, if you like it that much, because what happened, it, it takes your negotiation power away when the seller can hear what your comments are. We gotta have it. I don't care what we need to do. We gotta have it, you know? So the sellers know what your intentions are. So if you wanna have discussion, get back in the car, call them while you go to the next de destination, okay? All right, um, it is now 11 o'clock. So it's our mid break. So I'm gonna let y'all have a potty break and those of you online, just a little bit to catch up, okay? All right, we'll be back in 15 minutes, 11, 15. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes yeah, sir i get it all right for this really quick online please go and put your name license number telephone and your email address on the chat so i can validate that you're here after the break um so we're gonna go for with enforcement of code of ethics so hopefully y'all learn and earlier during the break I put in the answer to all those articles online. So those of you that can write it down. Um, every, so we're gonna move forward. If you have any question, once again, please ask it in Q and A, uh, the chats for you to put your information, your license number, uh, your name, telephone number and email address so we can validate your duration on Zoom, okay? And that you are actually attending and alive. Um, so anyway, so every uh, enforcement of code of ethics. So I wish you guys were here because we actually have really good conversation here too. Uh, every association and plus free breakfast. Uh, every association is responsible for enforcing the code. This includes providing mediation and conducting ethics and arbitration hearing. Only realtor and realtor associates are subject to the code, okay? All right, an association where someone holds a membership or gain MLS access has jurisdiction to process ethic complaints and arbitration requests filed against that in individual. Association do not determine violation of law and regulation, so they do not determine it, okay? Uh, there's two ways to do it. One is informal through ombudsman or mediation. The second one is formal. Okay, one's ethic complaints and through arbitration requests. And a lot of times, the only time we have anything like this happen, what, what's it for y'all? What's the bottom line? Why do we go through mediation and arbitration? So your commission. <laughs> yes, your commission we're talking about. It's all about money, right? So that's the only reason why we would do this, y'all. <laughs> So only available if offered by local association, not all associations offer them, uh, is a voluntary process. Ombudsman may, may feel and respond inquiry and complaints, solicit response and meet with disputing parties. Disputing reserve the right to file a formal ethic complaint. So even you go through this, you still have the right to file a formal ethic complaint. Primary role is communication and uh, conciliation, not adjudication does not determine an ethic violation, anticipate, identify, help resolve misunderstanding or disagreement before disputing or unethical conduct charges arise. So at the end of the day, ombudsman can help repair, break down the communication and develop acceptable resolution between disputing parties. And that's the best resolution because sometimes you may have a bad day and what you say may not be what you meant, okay? And, but it's perceived as that. So sometimes, you know, 
it's regrouping and you know sometimes it's okay to apologize i apologize to my kids half the time because i come home and i'm like frustrated and i'm like why isn't this just done <laughs> you know yeah. you've been here all day you know so but anyways they're i also have to remember they're only teenagers but at the same time i do uh, give them you know accountability as well because it's got to start somewhere uh, voluntary process ombudsman uh, informal dispute resolution mediation is a voluntary process like ombudsman unless association has discretion require realtor member to mediate per article 17. enable bylaw provision found article 7 of the nar model uh, bylaw for local member board must be adopted to mandate mediation uh, disputing party meet with a mediator appointed by the association Parties create a mutual acceptable resolution of dispute rather than go before arbitration hearing panel. Okay. So mediation is a preferred dispute resolution tool by the realtor organization, must be available to all realtors, may offer before or after grievance committee review. If offered before, must be offered again after grievance committee uh, committee determined matter is arbitratable and forward onto a hearing. Okay. So if a resolution is reached, party signs an agreement, contain a terms of settlement, and no arbitration hearing is held. So I had an agent that uh, basically tried to parachute in uh, because they have buyer brokerage agreement. And this other agent knew he wasn't hurting for money. So he's like, you know what? Yeah, let, let's just put it in arbitration, whatever. And so the other agent thought he was bluffing. and. Um, and so, but in a, at the end of the day, uh, they basically resolve through mediation instead of arbitration because arbitration will cost all parties some money deducted from the commission. And then once an arbitration is made, guess what? It's a done deal, it's a definite closure. So the difference between mediation and arbitration, uh, mediation is low cost. You have some costs in arbitration, mediation little these delay you may have moderate delay because these are people higher on their time to talk to you all right and do the communication we're not always very responsive sometimes maximum range of solution through mediation because we we are real estate folks right i know you guys are creative out there so you know you can be a really creative when you go through mediation where arbitration guess what you either win you lose or you split is very definite. Parties control the outcome, the parties involved, and for arbitration, arbitrator controls the outcome. Okay. Once they make a decision, we're done. Okay. Uh, there's, and through mediation, sometimes you have the uncertain closure because you gave up something because you didn't feel like it's worth it. Uh, so you have some uncertain closure where arbitration is a definite closure. Uh, it, mediation does maintain improved relationship and arbitration may harm relationship because at the end of the day somebody's gonna walk away not happy so there you go who can file an ethic complaint well first of all is there a potential violation of color ethics and i can tell you the agent who lied to the seller about being approved through showing time and the listing agent is in violation um Following hearing uh, panel decides what a code ethic has been violated, proven through clear, strong, and convincing evidence. If a code violation is found, then the panel also determines the discipline. So once you've been fined of the violation, they also dis uh, determine discipline. Uh, authorized disciplines are letter of warning, letter of reprimand, education, fine up to exceed $15,000. I don't know about you guys, but that's a lot of house to sell. Uh, probation of one year or less, suspension not less than 30 days, no more than one year. I can tell you if you're suspended for between 30 days to a year, or especially close to a year, you can just hang it up because you're gonna be poor for a long time. Expulsion from membership for one to three years, okay? Just so you know, Georgia MLS can terminate your broker's membership if they find your brokerage is a gross violation, okay? So, um, so I can tell you right now, if you, based on comments and Facebook, social media, 
that's against fair housing or anything political. Uh, and that is on the basis of fair housing. Based on that post, your broker is probably gonna let you go because they don't wanna be associated with that, okay? What you say does matter, special in a social media eye, okay? Do not put your own personal opinion when it comes to politics or different things that consider fair housing, okay? Um, so the MLS has the privilege to suspend your brokerage if your issue is not corrected. The primary emphasis of discipline is education to create a heightened awareness of, of and appreciation for color ethics. So how to file an arbitration request? Arbitration is conducted under Article 17 of the Code of Ethics and under the state arbitration statute, if any. Article 17 provides that ar arbitration occur under the following circumstances. Contractual specific non-contractual dispute as defined by standards of practice 17-4, those are the articles I was handing out earlier, and it's online too, between realtor principals arising out of their relationship as realtor. Just so your client may also arbitrate with the realtor principals. Okay. So we had a client that uh, filed a complaint on Greg, uh, stated that my agent should have known there was poison ivy because he bought a house and did a winter. Okay. So when summer came, guess what? Poison Ivy called up her house. And so she said that we should have known that there's poison Ivy there that we did not disclose. And we're like, uh, no, we don't live in that house. So she tried, but she, she didn't get anywhere with that. But you know, it doesn't surprise me sometimes client would, and she's like, I'm deaf. I personally am death allergic to poison Ivy. I have to get a steroid shot every time I touch one. So I get it, um, but you know, this is why you have, and I advise my agent say, this is why a buyer has inspection. You know, this is why, and unfortunately, because it's dead of winter, nobody would know. It's not us to know what your allergens are or your uh, fear of dogs or anything, unless it's disclosed, okay? Even then we can ask a question doesn't mean we'll get an honest answer. And we, and you, oh, by the way, in your guard contract, it does said, don't rely on us, the information we pass through to you when we hear from someone else. And so when you pass the information, make sure you cite the source, okay? Not your personal opinion, okay? Um, grievance committee and arbitration, there's an arbitrator issue that is a money dispute typically concerned which realtor is entitled to the cooperative commission in a transaction. So let me give you a scenario. Let's say Jim and I has a, Jim's my client, we have a buyer brokerage agreement, okay? And Jim and I have been go out looking for houses for a while, and then I kind of got tired because Jim won't ever pull the trigger, okay? Nothing makes Jim happy. <laughs> And so Jen decided, you know what? I'm gonna drive around to a new construction. And while, you know, I also, dis Jen disclosed to me, I have other realtor friends, but I choose to use you because I thought you're a good realtor. And now Jim has an exclusive buyer brokerage agreement with me, okay? But Jen happened to bump to Charles that weekend. Charles said, hey, based on what you described me, I think there's a subdivision nearby that I think you'll like. So Charles, you know, didn't ask the question of, do you have a realtor you're working with? Okay. And so Charles took Jim to the subdivision. Jim loved it. Okay. So Charles and Jim put a contract on the house. Now here I am sitting in the dark and I found out Jim wouldn't be on my back. Shame on you. I'm just kidding. Um, so, and so, I am trying to go after the co-op commission, okay? The problem is I am not the procurement cost for that particular property, Charles is. Charles is actually the procurement cost for that co-op commission. Now I can go to Jim and say, hey buddy, you owe me 3% based on our contract, you know, pay up. You know, now I can make a really bad scenario with Jim and make sure he pays or file a lien on him if I wanted to. But at the end of the day, who are you damaging in the long run? 
and also so I on the on the hand I can't go after the the co-op commission but I can definitely go after Jim based on the brokerage agreement okay so don't confuse what procuring costs versus a brokerage agreement is okay so a lot of agents think that they can well I have buyer brokerage agreement. well that's great but if you don't show them the houses guess what and they went somewhere else I got it you know all right and then your buyer brokerage agreement too it states that let's say Jim's agreement with me was January to the end of June okay and let's say Jim fired me in March because I wasn't doing anything for him and rightfully so okay um, so because it's unilateral any property now you have a protection period what that protection period does is that it protects you if you show Jim the house from January to March that he decide to go back and make an offer on but if there's any property that I didn't show him it doesn't count okay so I want to make that clear because a lot of people think protection period means oh I'm protected until the NR contract that's not true because especially if Jim has signed I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you say example that you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so now, especially if Jim has signed a contract with Charles, you know, based on their agreement, I'm technically out of it. Unless it's a property that I've shown him. Okay. All right. So talk about arbitration hearing panel conducts full due process hearing, compromise member from Association Professional Standard Committee, and that is a volunteer position. So if you get a chance please volunteer in your association, they need you. After hearing, panel decide which party is entitled to the award based on preponderance of the evidence. So they look at, just because you have a buyer broker agreement doesn't mean you're entitled to co-op, just so you know, okay? They so look at the sequence of the events. How did this buyer, what's led to this point to make an offer on this property, okay? Buyer brokerage agreement doesn't cut it all the time. All right. Payment arbitration award and unpay award typically may be judicially enforced because just remember you all sign a contract say I will do this and do that split whatever it is. Some association credit award money be deposited with association pending review of the hearing process or during a legal challenge. So, all right, concept of procuring costs. Basically, a guideline is found in code ethics and arbitration manual. Uh, guy hearing panel in resolving arbitration issues focus primarily on procuring costs as a basis of resolving most commission disputes. This is the only time we'll get fight with each other over commission. Okay. You keep a diary. Do I? No, not really. I just, you know. You, you advise your agents to do that if they're showing multiple properties. I don't. Um, and you know, it depends on how you practice. Yeah, maybe have a appointment with a similar, you know. The, you know, with showing time, the thing I love about showing time, anytime you show a house is registered. So I can look at showing time, look at the past showings. Yeah, I had an agent that got accused of parachuting in and she had kept a, a diary. diary. That's perfect. And the, the house had a duty agent on certain times, mm -hmm. but she was a part time agent. And when she was available to show, they weren't there and that sort of thing. And she didn't get logged in you might say mm -hmm. but, uh, it went to the court not, not to this level to mediation and, oh good and, uh, as i recall <laughs> so she was she was okay she had enough evidence that she had been right and, and you know i see we have an internal group okay that we kind of chat about what's going on stuff like that so one of the agent was bashing the buyer's agent said, you know, I don't get it. Uh, I'm having an open house and I had this buyer came up to me, gave me their agent's um, business card says, I even want you to know that it's open house and won't be here, but I am represented. So the selling, the, the seller's agent was upset about it and say, these, you know, lazy buyer agent, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you can't say that because you know what? We all take vacations. We all go to beaches, we all go to mountains, we all have some family time. You know, sometimes you have buyers that you, without knowing the history, you know, sometimes you have a, especially in today's market, 
you have a buyer that you have shown 30 houses, written 10 offers, nothing sticking. And that weekend on your particular house, they want to go see and they and because it's open house, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so don't criticize the issues unless you know what's going on. That's all I got to say. But I can tell you, um, we have, oh, and I hate to bash. Uh, and I promise you I'm not, I'm just stating the facts, okay? Actually, I am stating facts. There are new construction company right now that if your buyer registered, even though you have buyer brokerage agreement, you showed them 30 houses, written up five different coffers. If your buyer went online, Due to your direction, say, hey, these are some of the newer homes since your interest new home website, go and look at what they have in inventory. Okay. If you buy a register online with that particular company, you're not eligible for co op. So be aware because what they do when you come in, they'll make you sign, even though you, one of my agents was there with her client and she, under her, recommendation the client when looked up their front you know new construction home made a mistake registering because you know sometimes we'll go on the internet click 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 in order for you to pass the next step you have to put your email and address, you know name on it so that's what she did and so because upon signing in and their disclosure very small font it says if your buyer came through our website you are not eligible for the co-op commission Not only that, they only own to pay 2%. <laughs> so. I've seen that also, it's 1% if you're not with them when they come see the house. There's no legitimacy in that because I, I would tell you, I have seen uh, folks that just don't want to go show properties. I don't know why they're in real estate, but you know, um, that happens sometimes. But on the flip side, I have seen people showing 30 properties and not getting 10 offer stick. So there's both sides of, of every coin. Um, and yes, people will remember you for what you do when the market does even out. And it is what it is. You know, at the end of the day, once again, per ethic code and license law, you're not required to co op as a listing agent, but because we're so used to co-oping because that's how we make, um, that's just how we sell a property quickly. You know, at the end of the day, it serves both parties. That's the first thing we're supposed to cooperate, right? That's correct. Cooperate your money, what's going to cooperate? I know, I know, but you know, I also hear from both sides. Uh, one say, I'm doing all the work and the other one's not, blah, blah, blah. You know, let's get off the kindergarten kick. You know, at the end of the day, let's get the seal done. And be done with it, even if it means you got to write a couple extra amendments. This is a little off topic, but I was thinking about this when I know some of the previous agents. When you look at the commission portion of the listing, for instance, I saw one last night, a dollar fifty. Yes. All right. She, uh, you brought up a good point, and the question is, on your Georgia MLS, we have seen zero on co-op that is exactly what it is y'all so you need to let the buyer know when you make an offer either the buyer the price that needs to include a seller co-op commission or the buyer needs to pay you for the differences and there are one dollar a dollar fifty those are not mistakes y'all okay those are listed as is. So be aware when you look at MLS, pay attention to the listing. If you're not for sure, call the listing agent or text them. Okay. If they won't respond, then when you make the offer, you might want to put a special step in there to where the seller pays for the co-op commission. Otherwise you get big fat zero. And that is correct. Okay, and then, you know, a lot of listing agents right now, because they all know listing is king. So rather than the traditional 6%, they'll take a four and a half and they will reduce everybody's commission, which, you know, at the end of the day, some money is better than no money at all. In my personal opinion, that's not the norm. But once the market started tailoring off a little bit, I, I think you'll see the differences. 
Okay, but until then, we all just have to kind of get along and do what we need. Okay. So for carrying cost factor, there's no predeterminers. Consider the entire course event. Ryan offer making a first show or agency relationship in and of themselves do not necessarily determine procuring costs or entitlement. Okay, so just because you've done all these or one of the, the items does not make you the co-op agent. Okay, so what happened if the Jim came to me three months ago, I showed him that house. Well, not in today's market. And then Jim, him haul around, decided, yeah, you know, whatever. After he went and looked at another 25 houses, decided, hey, the first one wasn't too bad at all. And, um, and then called Charles and had Charles show in the house. Well, the problem is I was registered first. Even though Charles showed it, does not mean Charles entitled to that co-op. So there's a lot, that's what I'm saying. There's no predeterminers and it concerned a entire course event and procurement costs. So the definition of procuring costs, approximate costs, the costs originate a series of events which without breaking their continuity, result in accomplishment of the prime objective. So that's according to Black Law Dictionary, fifth edition. But according to the Arkansas Supreme Court, it's not the squirrel that shakes the branch and not the, it's a squirrel that shakes the branch and not the squirrel that gathered the nuts. Yeah, I thought it was really cute. All right, so now we're moving on in your handout on summary cases. Um, Article one talks about pr protect and promote your client's interests. This obligation is your client to your client as primary. Okay, treat all party honestly. Standard practice one to define terms such as client, customer, agent, and broker. Okay, there's a difference between client and customers, and I hope you all know that. All right, so case one study, let me pull that up. It's not in this slide. And yes, I have to scroll. This is not as pretty as the presentation, so. Am I making y'all dizzy online? All right. This is a case study. Realtor Leo is a sales associate with Dunright Realtor. To promote uh, Dunright in-house listing, the firm principal offer a $1,000 bonus to the company's sales associate for each items, each house sold. Um, in-house listing, I'm sorry. The firm's print, yeah, okay. Dr. Newcomer, a recent transferee to the town, inner buyer representation um, with them right, Realtor through Realtor Leo. Dr. Newcomer uh, explained that he has specific needs, okay? Foremost of which is that any home he purchased must be convenient for or readily accessible to Dr. Newcomer's spouse who is physically challenged, all right? Um, Part of my wife's physical conditioning program is swimming, said Dr. Newcomer. So he explained, in addition to everything else, I'm looking for a home with a pool or room to build a pool, okay? During the next few days, Realtor Leo showed Dr. Newcomer silver properties in the Black, uh, Black Acre subdivision, all of which are listed with them right, including one with an outdoor swimming pool. Not include among the properties shown the Dr. Newcomer silver similar homes in Black Acre that are listed with other firms, include one with indoor pool. After considering the party, uh, the pro after considering the property, he see with re uh, Realtor Leo, Dr. Newcomer make an offer on a home with outdoor pool. His offer is accepted and transaction closes. Several so months later, Realtor Leo Lucia noticed that an ethic complaint has been filed against him by Dr. Newcomer from a colleague at the hospital who lives in the same block. Dr. Newcomer learned that the home with the indoor pool that Realtor Leo failed to show him when Dr. Newcomer was looking for just the right property. The complaint alleged that Realtor Leo put his own interests and those of them right ahead of Dr. Newcomer interests by exclusively promoting them right listing and by not telling Dr. Newcomer about the similar price property with the indoor pool. 
Dr. Newcomer also uh, said in, in the complaint that he believes the unshown property suited his family need much better than the property he did purchase because his wife would have been able to use the pool all year long. The complaint spelled out Realtor Leo received a bonus for selling one of them right listing to Dr. Newcomer. And a Dr. Newcomer believed Realtor Leo failed to tell him about the house where the indoor pool was motivated by Realtor Leo's desire for the bonus. During the hearing, Realtor Leo deflect, uh, defend his action, explained that property rarely meet all the potential purchase desire, and that he made Dr. Newcomer aware of several property that met most of his requirements, including one property with an outdoor pool. Realtor Leo goes on to say that Dr. Newcomer has been satisfied because he ultimately purchased that home. With, when questioned by the hearing panel, Realtor Leo acknowledged he knew about but did not show the house with the indoor pool to Dr. Newcomer. He conceded that a year round indoor pool was better suited for family needs than a seasonal outdoor pool. Um, he also admitted that failing to tell Dr. Newcomer about the house with the indoor pool was at least in part, sorry, um, Motivated by the prospect, the bonus offered to, by him, his firm, but he also argued, aside from the indoor pool, the house is no different than the one Dr. Newcomer bought. So the last one sound like the realtor was self-serving there. Um, so the question is, put this online. Realtor Leo obligation under Article 1 call for hand to check that all applies. So y'all want to answer in chat really quick? You guys here can answer too. Check all that applies. Online, you guys can answer in chat if you like. Nobody? All right, Kimberly, good job. B is one the answer. No, actually, yeah, B is one of them. And C. So, Leo, uh, realtor leader should show Dr. Newcomer all property that meet his specific needs and requirement, regardless of whether those property are listed with Dunright Realtor or another firm. Okay. And also subordinate his own interest to those of Dr. Newcomer. And that is the bottom line, y'all. Okay. The next one is that Article 1 required Realtor Leo disclose $1,000 bonus at the time of entering an exclusive buyer representation agreement with Dr. Newcomer. So, true or false? Anybody online? Okay, it is false because it's an internal bonus. It's not bonus given outside of brokerage. You don't, you do not have to disclose it. Okay, but it would be good for you to. Well, actually, you buy a brokerage agreement. It specifically states that we may or may not receive bonus with certain properties. So, as you can see, the GAR form changes every year to protect us from liability reasons such as this. Okay. All right. So the answer to number two is false. If a second offer is submitted by, for the property by another real estate office at the same time as Dr. Newcomer's offer submitted, what disclosure to the cooperating broker, if any, would then my realtor be required to make? Online, you want to answer? Let's see if anybody, nope. All right, good job. Uh, Daniel, good job. Uh, so C, the existing of Dr. Newcomer offering that it was obtained by another licensee done with Denry Realtor, but only if asked by the other cooperating broker and given approval to do so by the seller. Okay, we have to have seller's approval. Okay, 
Good job. All right, I'm gonna answer a couple of online questions. Uh, I have a question about mediation arbitration. So going to court is not an option or in what circumstance court option can happen. So because you're a member of a realtor, you have to go through mediation first. If there, with the mediation, if there's no outcome and you still have a legal stance on it, then you can go to arbitration, okay? So it's mediation before arbitration, okay? So that's how it works. And just so you know, agents, you can't arbitrarily go to arbitration by yourself without your broker's uh, permission. Remember, your broker holds your e and o. Everything, if you remember your contract, the way it's written, it's under the brokerage name, not yours, even though you are the procuring cost for the contract, but the broker will be the one that actually file a lawsuit. All right, I also have another uh, comment. Many times in a new market, a listing agent aren't sending confirmation appointment until minutes before appointment. Uh, I mentioned that agents showing the property at incorrect time could, re, could be possibly considered as ethic violation. What about listing agent not conforming? If you show before you get confirmation, you're wrong. Yes, absolutely. If you're showing a property before you get confirmation, you're trespassing. So please don't do that. And I know it sucks and I know it's not the right thing to do, but you know, once again, the property is going to sell at the pace of whatever the market demands. So once again, if you don't have confirmation, you are trespassing and the seller can bring a lawsuit against you for trespassing because you have no authorization. The property is uh, normally if property is vacant, not out of town, you get automatic instant responses because it's occupied property we're talking about. And sometimes, just so you know, the reason why some of the listing agent won't answer is because if it's an REO property, let's say the house has got mold in the basement and the REO company, the asset manager is trying to cut out the sheetrock in the bottom where the molds have penetrated and haven't had the opportunity to do that. Well, if you show the house, if the buyer get infected with mold, they can sue the seller for trust. Well, first of all, you're trespassing, but they can sue the seller for having a product that's endangerment to the public, okay? And this is why you don't wanna go in before you're authorized to do the showing because sometimes there may be circumstances that prohibit, you know, a listing agent to allow you to show, okay? I, because I know a certain REO company, they will have to send, you have to sign a whole harmless before you even enter the property because they, the REO company know there's mold issue in the property and they wanna make sure you fully <laughs> are disclosed, okay? And, and I understand that your buyer is looking at you like, why can't we go see this property? Why can't we do it today? And explains, explain to your buyer the way I explained to you, I can't enter a property without authorization that would be considered trespassing. So understand there may be a reason, what the reason is, I'm not getting an answer. Uh, while I don't want to make you upset, but at the same time, I'm trying to protect you, okay? So anyways, just remember, there's always two sides of every story. And yes, not everybody operate in the same proficiency that you may operate. All right, next part. Article number two. Avoid exaggeration, misrepresentation, and concealment of pertinent facts about the property or the transaction. Uh, but there is no obligation to discover latent defects, not our job, okay? Matter outside scope of license or matter confidential under agency or non-agency relationship. Just like, you know, the wife doesn't want to tell everybody that she's getting divorced because to her that's embarrassing. And that's why they're delaying selling the house because, you know, until the court said, okay, you're free to sell, she technically can't sell. Okay. All right, the next article. All right, home builder, realtor Dean, show one his newly constructed house to buyer Bert. Bert sees some kind of construction beginning nearby. That's what that was the example I was talking about earlier. There you go. And asked Realtor Dean about it. He says, I really don't know. 
said Realtor Dean, but I believe it's the attractive new shopping center planned for this area. Following by BERT purchased one of the houses by BERT London Construction actually is a bottling plant and the area adjacent is zoned as industrial. By BERT filed a complaint with the board of realtors ch charging Realtor Dean with unethical conduct for failing to disclose a pertinent fact. He said in his complaint that had he known about the proximity of new bottling plant when he first saw the house, he would not have purchased it. During the ethic complaint hearing, Realtor Dean defense is that he honestly answered Bert's question because at the time he had no knowledge of what was being built. All he knew was that the other developer were planning an extensive shopping center somewhere in the general area. So he simply ventured a guess. Realtor Dean goes on to say that as indicated by Byers Bert testimony, he prefaced his response to Bert by saying he didn't know the answer to Bert's question. So is that a good out, y'all? No. Just remember, a lot of the publics look at you once you gain their trust as an expert in your field. Okay. So oftentimes when it comes to boundary dispute, a permit, a licensing, I refer them to a professional or the like Henry County uh, building and uh, permit building department, you know. You may want to call them and see what they're doing with this particular lots over there because even though i can do it my problem is if i get someone that's temporary in an office desk and tell me the wrong answer i'm going to relate the wrong answer to the buyer so um but i normally call and i double check say hey have you talked to a building permit you know according to lisa she said blah 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 you know so, but I would definitely encourage you and matter of fact, you can follow up with, I will probably do it in the email format. So one is written and two, there's showing that there, where the credit's coming from, where you're getting the, answer, uh, uh, the answers from. So just take yourself out of liability portion of it, but encourage them to, I highly recommend, I, matter of fact, I encourage you to call, just double check, because at the end of the day, this is your house, this is where you're gonna live and you should be comfortable in wherever you live, you know? So is Realtor D in violation article two? Online, you want to answer to? So the answer for that is C. Yes, because Realtor D is obligated to discover and disclose adverse factor that are reasonably apparent to a licensed real estate professional. So when we say development, we are professional we know where to go okay but once you discover once again like i said i will highly encourage the buyer say according to lisa this is what she said but i'll hire you hire, hire, highly encourage you to also call and just make sure it is satisfactory toward your needs okay number two how should realtor dean have respond when asked about new construction online you want to answer that you guys can answer here too. Yeah, the, the answer is B, explain, although he didn't know the answer, he will research it and get it back to Bert. Okay, and when you do that, make sure you do um, recommend when you, whatever it is, you give credit to where you heard it from um, and also reference telephone number, contact information as well, okay? All right, move on to the next case, Article 12. We have to be honest and truthful in real estate communication. Present a true picture in your advertising, marketing, and other representation. Ensure that your status as a real estate professional is readily apparent in your advertising, marketing, and other representations. So Article 12 case study, okay. So a principal tech-friendly realty realtor, Bob, is technology savvy and constantly look for a way to use the internet to promote his firm and drive uh, additional traffic to his website. Being early adapter to the internet, he registered, he did not use silver domain name that incorporate or play on the name of many of his competitor and their firm, including top-notch realtors. 
Realtor Bob and, he, and his information technology vendor recently came to the conclusion that one way to drive traffic to tech-friendly realty website is to take better advantage of search engine commonly used by potential buyers and sellers. That's why homes.com is so popular and Zillow. Um, Zillow actually built a reputation over time. I mean, they've been building since during downturn market. They determined that when potential buyer or seller search on real estate, realtors, or similar word, lists of related registered domain names appear. So Realtor Bob decided to activate some of his dormant domain name of his uh, competitor, including topnotrealtor.com, and use them to point consumer to his website. In a matter of day, Realtor Bob learned that he had been charged with violation of Article 12 of the Code of Ethics by the owner of Top Notch Realtor, Realtor, Realtor Sally, who alleged that Realtor Bob used the domain name topnotchrealtor.com, presenting a false picture of the internet to a potential buyer and seller. During that hearing, Realtor Bob defended himself by saying that, in his opinion, using domain names not advertising or representation to the public, but simply a convenient way for internet users to find relevant websites. He goes on saying, when a web surfer reached my homepage, there's no question but that it's my site because it clearly displays tech-friendly realty name and status as a real estate firm. He goes on saying, these complaints are just a lot of sour grapes from dinosaurs don't keep up with the time and who doesn't realize that on the internet it's every man for himself. <laughs> How'd you like that for a broker? <laughs> yeah. So there we go. So I got a common car sales person. <laughs> All right. Now this one you have to reflect back to your standards. Uh, which standard practice applied to this, this situation? You got nine through twelve, so you got twenty five percent choices. Pick one. See, I have a cheat sheet. So if you look at your standard practice on 12-9 through 12-12, which one would fit this one the best? Online, you want to take a stab at it? That's interesting. Okay, it's uh, standard practice 12 12, number D. Realtors shall not, it's very specific, use URL or domain name that present less than a true picture or register URL or domain name, which, if used, will uh, present less than a true picture. Okay, so that was adopted back in 08. So I think that's right around the dot com boom ish. All right, has Realtor Bob Bowley Article 12? That should be an easy answer for you guys. Online, you want to answer? Absolutely. If you said no, we have a chat after class. So he has violated Article 12. Absolutely. Article 12 12 specifically say you can't do that. Yes, because Realtor is copyrighted. Mm -hmm. Like I have back, back, back in the days, I had a website called dual realty, uh, realtors.com. Dual what? Dual, like two, both representing both sides, realtors.com. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had to take it down. <laughs> but that's before I knew any better. Uh huh. Uh huh. That was an issue. Uh uh. Nope. 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 My, it's, dad, my it's, dad was so proud of getting to be a realtor with his card said TK White Realtors, and he advertised that was on his sign thirty something years. And I became the broker, came to class. All right. Started 
changing everything to CKY <laughs> Real Estate Company. Right. <laughs> you can't use a realtor <laughs> at all. With the mm -hmm. It was <laughs> nobody complained. He didn't get it forced. No, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things who, you know, during downturn market it was funny. Um, there was a company that was targeted because they have both the real team realtor um, brokerage, I won't say who, but someone was going out there looking at all their signs uh, because the way they print their sign was um, the real, the way it was spelled, it didn't have the register logo on it. If you're a realtor um, board member, so they had to go back and print stickers for the R's on the signs. <laughs> So it's like, but somebody was targeting that company really bad because they were very successful. So anyways, all right. Case number two, article 12. Realtor Owen spotted a dilapidated for sale sign on the otherwise attractive woodlot. He get out his card, look at closer sign is barely able to discern Realtor Sloan's name, which later he used to locate Realtor Sloan's company website on the internet. Later, when he had a chance to review Realtor Sloan's website, he see detailed information about a lot. He sent an email to Realtor Sloan requesting lot dimension, the property's asking price. Several days later, he received a response that simply said, that listing expired. If I was a listing agent, I'd be calling the seller. Hey, I got a potential buyer for you. Can I get a list? <laughs> uh, the day after receiving an email from Realtor Sloan's, Realtor Owen contacted another area broker, Realtor Karen, who see a wood lot sale available. Realtor Karen uh, confirmed her firm has an exclusive listing on the property for the past six months. That's funny, said Realtor Owen. Realtor Sloan has a for sale sign on the property and information about it on his website. I was under impression he still had a listing. Although a lot was out of Realtor Owen's price range, the for sale sign information on Realtor Sloan website stay on his mind. Finally, he contacted the local association of Realtor and filed an ethic complaint alleged Realtor Sloan for sale sign and website information indicate the property is listed with his firm, but this has not been a case for over six months. So Realtor Owen writes that in his opinion, Realtor Sloan's conduct conduct violate article 12 because it does not present a true picture in a public representation and is advertising a property without authority. Practice both prohibited by article 12 as interpreted by standard practice of 12-4. During the professional standard hearing, Realtor Sloan claimed that failed to remove for sale sign was simply an oversight. If anyone is to blame, it's his personal assistant because you know it's hard to get a good help anymore, right? Uh, Brenda, who was responsible for removing sign lot boxes from expiring sold listing, he said, if you want to blame anyone, blame her. Since she's supposed to bring back all of our for sale and sold sign, Realtor Sloan acknowledged that the stale listing information on his website continued to appear for more than six months after listing expired and compared us to find um, outdated property information in old newspaper advertisement. It's possible, he pointed out, that someone may have come across a six-month-old newspaper with my listing in it, and those ads were true when I ran them. How can I control when and where someone will come across new uh, old newspaper ads, month or even years later, he asked. Besides, Realtor had a better thing to do than constantly monitoring the website to make sure that everything is absolutely positively up to the minute. If we did that, none of us will have time to list or sell, he concluded. <laughs> Awesome. Mm -hmm. So question number one, is Realtor Sloan obligated to keep his company listing information up to date on his firm website? Yes. Absolutely all day, okay? And just remember in our technology uh, competitive environment, there's no reason why you can't change the listing instantaneously, okay? All right, number two, is he obligated to keep his website current and how long does Realtor Sloan have to remove his out there or expire property information from the website? Online, you can answer this too. Y'all? Yeah. Which one? D? Yep. It is, the answer is D. Realtors should use reasonable effort to ensure information on their website is 
current and accurate, and it depends on a multiple listing service IDX and VLW rule. The IDX are and VLW are the reciprocating website, the syndicate website like Realtor.com, Homes.com, Zillow. They pull the IDX out of the Georgia MLS to post on their site. And when they first started, I think there were like at least one day lapse of information. Sometimes change because they did a daily download versus uh, hourly or minutes. Uh, right now, I know Zillow does uh, just in time uh, updates on their files. So um, it should be pretty current. All right, so number three, when he took the listing, Realtor Sloan received permission from seller Post to sign on property and to advertise on his website. Such authority remain in fact, even after the listing expires. True or false? That should be an easy one, that is false. Okay, all right, one more studies. Hey, I'm good on time. Uh, Realtor principal require, oh, hang on a second. Yeah, realtor principal require arbitrary contract, contractual and specific non contractual dispute identify standard practice 70 4 and that they have with realtor principal and other firms. And realtor climate invoke mandatory arbitration with a realtor and realtor obligated to cost or firm to arbitrate. So just remember if you're doing, you guys have the you know, uh, insurance. The reason for that is that if y'all screwed up, Guess who gets to do the arbitration? It's a brokerage that get involved. Okay. All right. Realtor Linda Amy participate in cooperative co transaction that results in a dispute over entitlement to compensation rather than request arbitration. Local association realtor Realtor Linda instead filed a lawsuit against Realtor Amy for compensation she feel is owed to her. When realtor Amy received notification, a lawsuit has been filed. She turns around, requests arbitration at the local association. Because Linda and Amy, a realtor principal and in different firm, the association grievance committee classified arbitration as mandatory and scheduled it for a hearing. Realtor Linda received a notice on grievance committee's decision but refused to withdraw her lawsuit. So Realtor Amy then filed at the complaint alleged that Realtor Amy has violated Article 17 as interpreted by Standard Practice 17-1. After receiving a complaint, the, the uh, association scheduled a hearing before the board director. During the hearing, Realtor Amy pre presents evidence that she sought Realtor Linda's agreement to submit a dispute to arbitrate. Realtor Linda defend her action by asserting that under the state law, Realtor Association had no authority to bar her access to the court or to require to arbitrate dispute without a realtor. Their board director acknowledged that realtor Linda is correct about her legal rights, about the association inability to prevent her from filing a lawsuit. That said, the board director pointed out the association is a volunteer organization whose member agree to assume certain obligation with respect to their relationship with the realtors, with other realtors. The board advised Linda she wished to continue as a realtor member she is obligated to adhere to the um, code's duty to arbitrate as established in Article 17. Just so you know, if Realtor Linda um, do not wish to uh, withdraw the legal rights prior to uh, arbitration, um, the board can remove the entire brokerage out of their membership. Okay, and I can tell you right now, the broker is not gonna let that happen. The broker will release the agent in a heartbeat. Um, so as a part of realtor, you are required to arbitrate before you file a lawsuit, okay? All right, question. Does filing litigation against another realtor over a contractual dispute always lead a violation of Article 17? Y'all can answer online too. I got one brave warrior out there, I answered. <laughs> yes, I'm guilt tripping you guys online too. All right, a lot of C's. And that is correct. It depends on whether A, a request for arbitration has been filed and two, the grievance committee can determine the matter be arbitratable in a mandatory nature and a separate ethic complaint alleged charge of Article 17 has been filed. All right. 
Number two, realtor may be relieved of their obligation to arbitrate through local association of realtor when, <coughs> excuse me. I didn't think it was gonna line up. Hang on. Y'all in class? Online? Okay, so the answer is E, all the above. Okay. So what happened is that when the grievance committee is finding the the is finding matters too, there's too much noise in the background. There's not really a a written solid evidence. So they'll do that. Um, or both party also volunteer to choose to litigate rather than arbitrate. Uh, the arbitration is classified as voluntary by grievance committee and the request for arbitration is filed after the filing deadline, okay? That I do not know. So it depends on the local association, huh? I believe if I remember correctly, now if a client's going after you on the guard contract, I believe it's two years. Now statute of limitation in Georgia is seven years. Um, so, but it depends on what the cases are and what the, but I believe on guard contract is two years, okay? Because honestly, anything after two years, do you remember? I can't remember what I ate last night, half the time. I just know it's good. Sometimes people get in a hurry because they want to tie up the mm -hmm. commission where it'll be held. And right. Well, decided. people want their money immediately. So, you know, a lot of time mediation, I promise you, is probably the best way to do it. Unless you have such a solid evidence that you know you can't lose and you're okay to, and it's a substantial amount and you're okay to wait. You know, commercials for one, commercial notorious. You know, we had a client that uh, according to the contract, they were done with that offer. The protection period was done. This is commercial and everything has expired, but this commercial agent apparently has a relationship with the closing attorney who informed them, hey, by the way, the buyer you introduced to the previous uh, seller is coming back and they're closing on this day. So of course the, um, the first broker uh, filed a, uh, a lien on the property, a commission lien on it. And in order to clear it up, you know, seller has a choice of either going to court, which can drag out two years, especially during COVID time, because all the court were closed. Most of them were. And so the seller just got tired of us and paid it. And they really had no ground to stand on. But the seller's like, you know what? That's the last time I'll deal with y'all. So, but anyways, all right. Is the failing to pay arbitration award always violate Article 17? Y'all can answer. Oh, by the way, online, I have launched a poll. Please answer the poll online. Y'all? Yeah. The answer is B, if only a pattern arbitrary refused to pay arbitration award is established, it will be a violation, okay? And basically, the conclusion of code ethic is to protect the buying, selling public, and general public, promotes a competitive real estate marketplace, enhance the integrity of a professional, and is our promise to perform our promise of professionalism. Okay. Um, I have just a few more minutes, and I do want to point these out to you on the new changes on COE. Uh, oh, we have a test. Uh, let's do this real quick. Um, real, only realtor and where applicable realtor associate are subject to code ethic, true or false, really quick. 
That is true. Number two, the authority conduct arbitration established in Article 17 uh, of the Code of Ethics. True or false? Y'all can answer online too. True. When the Code of Ethics and state law conflict, law takes precedence. That is true because, you know, it's a law. The NAR board director must approve changes in uh, code of ethics. The NAR delegation body must approve any changes to the article. True or false? It's true. It's okay. The code of ethics is divided into three major sections titled duty to client and customer, duty to the public, and duty to the community. True or false? 50 50 shot. It's actually false. It's duty to other realtors, brokers. Okay, not a community. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> she said she meant the real uh, community. There you go. The standard practice support, interpret, amplify the respective article. True or false? Online's jamming. All right, it's true. Uh, first adopted in 1913, the purpose of the co ethic was to establish a professional standard conduct for real estate practitioners. True or false? Yes, true. Absolutely true. The official interpretation of the code of ethics was specific facts, situation that explained the article and the standard practice of the code of ethic. True or false? 50 50. This is the kind of boring section, but true. Uh, only a realtor may file ethic complaint, make requests for arbitration. True or false? Yeah. Remember, I told you a client can do it too. The code of ethic always have required that will to respect other broker exclusive relationship. True or false? All day. The first code of ethic was based on license law. True or false? Thank you. You pay attention. So the code of ethic was established because not everybody's a realtor. We came up with license law to keep everybody practicing real estate and compliance. Okay, so that's false. Number 12, the procuring cost is determined factor in ethic case. True or false? True. False, actually. False. The procuring cost is not, uh, is the, uh, the articles themselves. Um, the preamble to code of ethic if violated may be based for disciplinary action. True. False. <laughs> okay. We're doing this in a hurry. 50-50, okay? Uh, the code ethic includes 17 articles that are broad statement of ethical principles. Now, that should be an easy one. Okay. Charles got it. It sounds true. Enforcing the code ethic rests with each state regulatory body, each local association of realtors. True or false? Absolutely. This is why we have National Association of Realtors. Thank you. Um, ethic complaint often are based on dispute between realtor of different uh, firm over referral fees. What do y'all go after? What, what do y'all go after? Commission. So that is false. The code requires realtors to present a true picture of all their advertised uh, representation. True or false? All right. Article four code prohibit exaggeration and misrepresentation and concealment of permanent facts of a property or transaction. False. It's not Article four. Just so you know, <laughs> that was a trick one. Uh, disciplinary action and ethic hearing can include a fine of no more than a thousand dollars. Let's see if you guys were paying attention to that. What was it? $15,000. So uh, faults on number 19. The standard of proof and ethic here is a preponderance of the evidence. That is false. Preponderance evidence is talk about procuring costs. Okay. The ethics and arbitration enforcement process include initial screening by a grievance committee. True or false? Yes. Absolutely. And ombudsman different entitlement to comp compensation and arbitration hearing. False, that's right. Ombudsman's voluntary arbitration is, man is basically mandatory and it's 
is two separate. One's a volunteer, one is not. Mediation is a preferred dispute resolution system of the National Association of Realtors. Yes, the pathway to professional document feature a list of professional courtesy and etiquette that may be voluntary followed by the realtors. That's actually true. These are volunteer. We volunteer to be an associate. Remember, when you're an association, you volunteer to be there. You're not bound to it, but you volunteer to be, volunteer to be in that association. Therefore, you abide by their rules. Okay. The code ethic is what set realtor apart from other real estate professional because establish a higher level of performance and professionalism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely all day. All right, I do want to go over this. And this is important because not this one. Not this one. Not this one. Okay. The code ethics, standard practice. Just want you to know that if you have posted something, this is something new. Um, and this changes for 2021. If you have post something in reference to speech, a hate uh, speech, epithet, or slur based on race, color, religion, sex, handicap, or marriage status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity, huge no no. Okay. So what you want to do is go look at your previous posting, make sure you don't have anything like that. Uh, is the uh, speech harassing is, well, first of all, you analyze this, the, the post. Is the speech harassing speech, hate speech, epithet, or slur? If so, is the speech based on race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familiar status, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity? If so, the standard practice of 10 5 pi only to conduct occur after November 13, 2020. So if you may, and sometimes with social media, you may post something as innocent as a general comment, but because a response to your comment can be derived as derogatory or not in accordance to fair housing, you better take that post down. Okay. It's serious because you can lose your realtor membership and if not get fined, if not get sued for fair housing, even though you weren't the one making that comment because your post supported that segment. Yes. So anything political, anything that I talk about fair housing, please just take it down because you guys are in the public eye. You know, why would you want to portray yourself so vehemently about something that can 50% of your clients gonna love it, 50% of your clients gonna hate it? Why would you do that? Because you're a public. <laughs> See? <laughs> uh, and there's nothing wrong being in committee, but you should not put a a statement brought as representing a realtor, okay, and confluence with that, okay, because we all have different parties and it's okay. It's okay, make your stand, but you don't have to announce it publicly about certain things or criticize somebody as a hate speech, you know, because we may all believe in certain things but it doesn't mean you have the right to attack my beliefs okay so same thing with political stance y'all avoid it okay may want to look at your social posts i'm just saying uh so the uh, center um the sop 10 10 5 went in effect on november 13th so other mention in fact that's january 1st 2021 so if it well i can tell you there's an agent who was suspended from her brokerage because she made a comment that was political. Okay. And somebody caught the wind of it. And so the broker basically had to release her. Um, very producing agent. And I understand we all believe certain things, and that's okay because that's what makes us unique. Okay. There's nothing wrong being unique, but you might want to keep your opinion to yourself in the public eye. Okay. So, and there's explanation about the uh, code conduct and, and anti-harassment because whatever it is, it may be 
And it doesn't matter if you didn't mean it, but if somebody construed as a harassment, you know, then you're on the hook for it. So epithet, slur, negative stereotyping, threatening, intimidating, or hostile act, um, the degrading jokes and the display of circulation of written. Now I can tell you right now, in my lifetime, we have all made joke in our close friends about certain things that we think it's funny, okay? In that group setting, it is funny, okay? Outside that group setting, it's not funny because it is what it is, you know, because we don't know what the history of the person that's receiving it uh, perceive it as, because they may have a history of that. And for them it was real, and then people make fun of it, it's considered harassment. So I just want you guys to be very, very sure that whatever you do, please just stay out of it, okay? Because our job is to be professional, and that's the bottom line. Um, so Merriam-Webster's definition of hate speech, speech that is intended to insult, offend, or intimidate a person because some trait as real, fair housing, basically, okay? Um, and also epithet, a character working on phrase, a company on occurring in a place of the name of a person or thing or disparagingly or abusive word or phrase. And slur is insulting or disparagingly remarks or innuendo as person, um, a shaming, degrading effects, uh, stain or stigma. So, you know, free speech, according to Congress, shall make no law a bridge of speech, the freedom of speech. You are still able to have freedom of speech, okay? Just know where it's appropriate, not appropriate. Is that just under your membership? Yeah, well, yes, you, you can definitely do that, okay? Uh, applicability of the code ethics. Uh, so they scratched out to non-real estate related activities, okay? Um, you can see the changes. A realtor shall subject to discipline action under the code ethics with respect all of their activities. That has been changed. Used to transaction involve the realtors, you know, it's very specific, but they're talking about all their activities now. Um, Devised this parent guideline as emphasis for violation of the public trust. Uh, new example C with violation SOP 10 5. Uh, first violation example number three, repeat violation example number three, add factor related to violation Article 10 and Article 3 as supported by SOP 3-11. Important note, these are not sentences, sentencing rule or requirement, but rather simple, simply suggestion to guide hearing panels and determine appropriate discipline based both on the current violation and the violator's previous record of ethic conducts. Okay. Um, just remember the public trust as used in contacts refer demonstration, misappropriation of clients or customer funds or property, uh, discrimination against a protected class under the code of ethics or fraud. So they took out all these other words, willful, okay? Because obviously if you didn't mean it, why well, wouldn't just, you know, say it. Uh, article, Four, Code of Ethics, Section 2 of the NAR Bylaw. Enforce the Code of Ethics also require member board to share with the state, real estate licensee authority, final ethic decision holding realtor in violation of Code of Ethics and stances involve real estate related activity and transaction where there is a reason to believe the public trust may have been violated. So if you have any questions, the NAR resource link is there, it's in the handout. If you don't have the handout, please go to uh, www.max1partners.com forward slash CE. All these are available for you to download. Once again, I thank you all for your time here. Before you leave, please put your name, license number, email, and telephone address online so we can register you being here for the whole duration of three hours. And thank you all for attending because I know color ethics or license law is not the most fun topic. Um, hopefully I made this class a little more informative and uh, welcome back anytime. And thank you all for the one here on, in person.